I'm Mark Boris and this is Straight Talk. You fucking pricks. James Smith likes to piss off the fitness industry. One of the PTs took me aside and was like, mate, if you keep talking to my clients, I'm going to take your head off. <laughs> Every day, it was my opportunity to try and cause ripples in the industry. He throws out the style tactics that promise you a six pack in six days. You're a bodybuilder who's getting annoyed that I've called you stupid or, you know, James, I want to compete. I'm like, you don't. You want to keep your menstrual cycle. You want to lose a bit of weight and you want to have a better relationship with training. They get to compete their insecurities against a load of other people in fake tan. I was like, well done. He's a no bullshit fitness expert who wants to level up your body and your mind. I had to be crass, rude, polarizing, facetious. So how the fuck do they still have this question? I'm getting annoyed now just thinking about it. Who the fuck invited this guy? I get annoyed at able-bodied people that stand still on escalators. You've been given the opportunity to move faster and you decided to stand still. You know, you give someone an opportunity in life, you want them to use that to move faster, not as an opportunity to do nothing. You're the second guy I've seen today with shorts and t-shirt. Oh, it's, you know, it's one of the favorite things about becoming a PT was I could give up wearing trousers. I think yeah, I'm, but um, it's cold though. It's probably not cold for you. I get really hot legs. And it's the first thing, you, especially if I get flustered, it's my legs that get hot first. Really? Yeah, so I'm like, uh, it, it's the one way. I'd rather be a little bit too cold than a little bit too hot. And I worked corporate before. And uh, going into an office where you're a little bit sweaty and you're wearing a jacket and you become self-conscious of being sweaty, yeah. and you don't want to wipe your forehead too much in a meeting, I've been there. So if anything, I like to be on the cold side. Well, you should get a Bermuda where they wear sh actually wear shorts. My mum, when I was a kid, everyone wore shorts called Bermuda shorts. And we used to wear socks and leather shoes with it. We're going back, it was old school. And uh, when I went to Bermuda, I got the shock of my life. Um, Bermuda shorts actually come from Bermuda and they wear these shorts and long socks and leather shoes and a shirt and a tie to work. I think it's a little bit of a rebellious thing as well. So I work in, we have an office in Wynyard. Everyone's very corporate and... I had to, for a large part of my life, try and fit in with that. And I'm not a corporate person. I'd have to lie when people ask me what I got up to at the weekends. Really, I've been drunk on the back of a rugby bus, puking into a bin bag. <laughs> I was like, yeah, just went for dinner with my friends. So uh, some days I skateboard into the city as well. Do you? It was like and, you one of those electric ones? Uh, no, no, no. I've got uh, like a, a cruiser with big wheels and I go from Bondi. I go downhill all the way into the city, but then I get the train back. And uh, yes, I got into winyard into one of the buildings the other day and I pressed the floor. We're only in a shared working space. The business isn't that big yet. And um, someone was like, what's on that floor? Because he was like, look at the state of you. I'm sweating. I've got a skateboard. I'm in my shorts and everyone else is in a suit. So I think I quite like that side of things as well, where you can roll around different parts of the city. And... Oh, Sydney's like that too. Mm. I mean, London's not like that. You get even weirder looks in London, especially uh, when I see the publishers, HarperCollins, they're right in the city of London. And the same, the tube that goes out to that area, like bank and everyone's suited and booted. But there was one time where you go through phases and I remember the first time I bought a gold Rolex. I was like, really like a GMT, rose gold, ridiculous watch. And uh, I would wear that with the stupid outfit and the bankers would be like, what does this prick do? <laughs> what does he do? Why, how's he got one of those? So I quite like that mystique, but I think I'm growing out of that phase now. England's a lot different to what what we have here. It's sort of a pretty judgmental one if you're not sort of kitted out the right way, particularly if you don't went, didn't go to the right school. Well, what what the fuck it anyway? By the way, is a, an Englishman doing here in Australia? What are you doing here? I came here. Uh, well, I was personal trainer in the UK for a few years, and I was living probably an hour outside of London which is kind of an awkward distance where you're close enough to go in whenever you want. And I managed to make it to the kind of top of the ranking of PTs, kind of met the threshold of what I could earn as a personal trainer. And I sat back and thinking, I'm going to have to move to the city. And if I want to be earning £100 an hour, I'm not going to be doing it in a place called Bracknell, which probably has got one of the highest teen pregnancy rates in the UK. So I had to get out. Now, um, well, so with that, Essex, apart from Essex. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'd like giving Essex a bit of shit. And um, so I was like, okay, I'm going to have to move to the city. And I thought, well, London's never really appealed to me. So if not this city, what other city? And I'm throwing it around in my mind. And I always saw Sydney as the fitness capital of the world. Nine months summer to us Brits anyway. So I was like, I'm just going to go there, see what it's like. And crazily, if we rewind a month before that, I'm in Croatia. I've just done a big festival. A lot of Aussies were there. But I met someone who was working in the back of a minivan. And he was an accountant. I said, what are you doing? He goes, I'm working on my laptop. And I couldn't fathom that he was working abroad online. And he goes, mate, can I give you a bit of advice? Read a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. 
So I took his advice. I went home and I read it and it kind of gave me the first idea of having an online personal training business, which for years, no one, they were like, how can you do that online? It's like being an online car mechanic. To most people, it was like, that doesn't make sense. So I was like, I'm going to email my email marketing list and ask them if they want to do online PT. And I'm going to go to Australia one way. And I came here and I had 10 clients who were paying me about $100 a week. In the UK? Yeah. yeah. And I was the only backpacker in Australia at 27 who was making, you know, hundreds of dollars a week by just servicing online clients. And after being here for a few months, I, I was a classic pom. I live in Bondi. I was like, I, I don't want to leave. I love it here. Did you decide there and then that you want to become a, a personal trainer in Australia or did you decide then, but there and then you're going to become a remote personal trainer? So I, um, I came to Sydney and I was like, I need to get a job because I can't live off several hundred dollars a week. I need to go back to almost a proper personal what trainer. What pounds though? You were charging, you were hopefully continue to charge your clients pounds. Yeah, still. yeah. So yeah, I had a little PayPal auto uh, payment set up and it did a weekly payment. And as soon as the money came in, I'll check in with them. Hey, is everything all right? You know, make sure your clients are happy. So it was about, call it $1,000 a, a week at the time. And that's, that's like one bedroom rent in Bondi. Yeah, pretty much. And I was like, okay, I'm going to go to the city and ask gyms, hey, I'm a palm, I'm overseas. And the gyms weren't really interested. They're like, no, you're just going to piss off. Your visa problems are going to come out your ears. So I went to Fitness First George Street and I managed to get a, a one-year contract there. When I went into that gym... In the UK, I had five, six, maybe eight personal trainers to compete with. In Sydney, there was 32. Really? 32 personal trainers. In that particular gym? In just that one gym. Whoa. And the participation rate of personal training is a lot higher in Australia and it's a lot higher in Sydney. You mean Australians use, uh, Sydney people use personal trainers more often than anywhere else? Yeah, and they value it as a service much more because it's more of a profession. In the UK, if you were to say to your friend, I'm using the PT, they go, oh, don't waste your money. In Australia, they, they champion it. They'd be like, good on you, you know. So I came here and the first day prospects here on the gym floor, I found that almost everyone I spoke to was like, I have a personal trainer. On my first day, one of the PTs took me aside and was like, mate, if you keep talking to my clients, I'm going to take your head off. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, cool. We're in a competitive environment yeah, yeah. here. And it was only really the frustrations of trying to build a business and failing in Australia that led me to fully commit to going online. And a friend of mine in the gym, another English lad, he was like, what are you doing? You know? do you know what people would do in this gym to earn a thousand dollars a week without having to come into it? And it was then that the turning point kind of turned. And I'll never forget a franchise I had to sign on with said, we're going to go out with clipboards at lunchtime and we're going to take people's contact information. This is early 2017. And even then I thought you could create an online squeeze page. Why not put a little, you know, page out there. Hey guys, here's a six week PDF or how this works and obtain email addresses. And that fell on deaf ears with everyone in the gym. And I was like, I'm not going to accept the stereotype that Australians were a little bit behind, potentially British marketing culture. But no one else saw a business outside of their four walls. And I took it upon myself to, you know, try and captivate that audience, not be geographically restricted, and to eventually try and build something scalable. Is it the opportunity that got you excited to stay here? Or is it fact that Australians were behind in terms of their marketing capabilities in a, in a digital sense. I mean, was it, is this something that, wow, I can turn this into a big online business? Was that what sort of kept you punting or was that, or was it, oh, no, that it's just, I'm just better than everyone else here. I'll be able to build my own little clientele up. What, not, what? not the latter. To, not the latter. To me, it was more so everything had fallen into place almost accidentally. And I was like, wow, I'm, I'm in a position now where maybe I'm seeing an opportunity others aren't. And when I was recording content on the gym floor in a bid to fuel the top of my funnel, no one could understand it. They were like, why is this PT recording content instead of servicing clients? But then when I left the gym, the blue skies, the good coffee, the people, the lifestyle, being a Brit overseas, you do often have a bit of a British click, but everyone's got this same vulnerability to being British abroad. We're all a long way from our parents and our families. And because of that, you're a lot closer. You share a lot more. If you stay here for Christmas. You mean to, to, your, expat, to your expats? Do you mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then living together, you know, we would have uh, orphans Christmas where we would, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, seen those. do those things. And, and Or down on Bonner Beach. Yeah. On yeah. New Year's Eve. And because of that, there was that. But then also the lifestyle here was much different to the UK. And it really opened my eyes to a culture that I'm not sure you'd agree with me, but in the UK, there's a rat race to see who can earn the most money, which I don't think there's a problem with at all, but... They're doing it in a bid to escape 
a mundane lifestyle. This is my understanding where they're on the London underground. They don't see a lot of blue skies. They need to go into Europe as part of that kind of ecosystem to be happy. I'd go on trips as often as I could, rugby sevens, tournaments, whatever it was. And it was only coming to Australia that I realized that there wasn't much things that I got happiness from my life in the UK. There were many things that you could have pleasure from, nights out, alcohol, uh, you know, festivals. And you look forward to those stints of pleasure to keep you afloat. Whereas in Australia, I suddenly had this abundance of happiness. I taught myself to skateboard at 28. Uh, I'd go down the beach, I'd go for a swim, even on my own, which was a really weird thing. I'd finish personal training at 3 p.m. I'd come home, make content before the UK woke up, hit them with a 7 a.m. post. Then I'd have this little like period of time for maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And I was like, I live a mile from the beach. I can skateboard down, shave that, commute to the beach by 80% and walking up is the same speed. And I was like, I don't feel like going on holiday. I don't feel like leaving Australia. I don't feel like leaving Bondi. I can enjoy this weekend without getting pissed. I was like, wow, I actually really enjoy my <laughs> lifestyle. And when I say that, I'm not shitting on British culture. I feel like maybe I was an Australian born in a British body. And it's, it's a very strange emotion to say to people. And I'm not saying that we should all be uniform. We, sh we all need uniquely different tastes and opinions. Otherwise, the world would be an awful place. And yeah, just really strangely enjoyed the lifestyle. And everything to do with my business was about having the freedom to enjoy Australian life with trips back to the UK. Yeah, so it's just like you sort of unpicked your lifestyle, then you unpicked the Australian lifestyle and you, you took out of that what you wanted as opposed to what you're sort of forced to have if you're living in a place like London. Equally, you went and unpicked the business side of your life too and then you decided to take the best elements out of both and run your own business, which is called the James Smith Academy, which is... Original. Uh, <laughs> that's, who's James Smith? Here he is sitting in front of me. And you obviously written this book here, which uh, we'll talk about in a moment in, in the book about how to be confident. How many years did it take you to come to all these realisations? It was, first of all, I always felt like a bit of a fraud being a personal trainer. You're trading an hour of your time for in Australia up to $120. Is that how much? Like, There's 120 bucks around about that. Yeah. Or 100, 120 bucks. Yeah. When, um, when I was peating in Sydney and that was kind of like the going rate. Now there was definitely some hypocrisy with this where I wouldn't pay someone $120 for an hour of personal training. So already I felt like there was something, there was a bit of a paradigm shift there I didn't enjoy. And every time I got paid, I couldn't actually be grateful for it because I didn't feel deserved of it. Because really? it, it was something where I wouldn't do the same back in return. I was like, I have the knowledge, but the application of giving it to you over an hour and training you at the same time, I was like, I felt a rift with that. So I thought to myself, I'd love to give people all the information possible. And I was doing that on social media as a bid to win them over as a client. So my initial sales funnel was, I'm going to give you so much free content on social media that you're going to come in for a consultation and become my client. And that then removes the pain point of me having to prospect, which I didn't like. I don't like talking to people and being rejected all day. I did that enough on the phone in sales roles before being a PT. But then I was like, okay, how about we have social media content, then curated content to help people. And then help them what? Help them what? Understand what calories are, what macros are, how to track calories, tactics they can use to, you know, Teaching someone to track their calories starting on a Friday means that they can understand the impact of their calories across the weekend and the week after. A bit like budgeting, where people spend a lot on the weekend, then they have to go to living off sandwiches during the week. People don't see the same with their nutrition. So that one minute video could impact someone's way of thinking for a very long period of time. That's the free stuff. Yeah. And, yeah, and that's then, the burly. But then the stuff that was at the top of the funnel, the social media stuff, I had to be, you know, crass, uh, you know, I'd have to be sometimes rude, polarizing, facetious. I mean, uh, social media is a crowded room. I need to get someone's attention before they leave. cut through. Yeah. And I'd be like, you know, starting off a, a hook with swearing, you know, I start off a video just saying, you fucking pricks. You've done. And then people are like, oh, who's he angry at? And that would be my way of getting them to buy into the next 10 seconds, which would buy them into the next few minutes. Or I'd be like, slim emoji, you fucking lying boss, you, whatever it is. See, so if you, you look for a target really good way to build a little storyline is that you find a villain and you, you you either become the villain or the hero. You sort out villains or you create villains. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, I, yeah. and I could create almost straw man arguments against bodybuilders because they weren't my demographic. Vegans because they're hard work. Yeah. Low carb communities because I don't believe the evidence supports strongly enough. And again, if people are in these demographics, they're already too far gone in their journey to really be attracted to my business. Yeah, yeah. 
But then you need someone. I wasn't that person as a personal trainer. I had to be that person on social media. So one day leaving the gym, there was another James who was leaving as I was joining. And I said to him, why are you leaving? You know, personal training, ludicrous money, $120 an hour. And he goes, I don't like working with people. I'm off to build websites. So I said to him, okay, I've got this idea where maybe for £20, $40 a month, we could give people a library of uh, information and we can continually grow it as the business goes on. And I said, if we get a thousand people, I had 10,000 followers at the time. If we convert 10% of my following to buy, that's $40,000 a month we can make in revenue. There's no way you can make that PT, yeah. as a PT. So we start building it. And this was just as my social media was starting to grow. I was starting to understand when to post, what to post, how to capture attention. At this point, I didn't have the DSLR cameras. I didn't have the microphone. I had my iPhone and a tripod. So I'd go live at 3 p.m., which was 6 a.m. in the UK. And I had a three-minute opportunity to get everything out. I had a whiteboard stuck on my wall statically. And every day, it was my opportunity to try and cause ripples in the industry. Are you talking about the Australian industry or the English industry? The majority English. English. So, so I actually, probably 80% of everything I earn is in the UK. Right. Everyone thinks I am a fucking idiot for living in Australia. And well, I, except it's, you, you know, you know the reason why you're living here. And this is tough because... You know, and, and I'm, that's why it's really important I don't talk shit about the UK. One, because my my demographic is there, the people that I help live there. Yeah. Also, I don't want to, you know, say to people their decisions are wrong. But for me, I'm just happier here. And that does mean earning less money. And I'm okay with that. It does mean having less opportunities for PR, press, media, TV. I'm okay with that. And yeah, the majority of my audience, even now, I would have had a YouTube video that just went out five minutes ago on a schedule because I have to aim for that UK audience. What time would that be? 7 a.m. or something? What time is yeah, it? they're yeah. just waking up. How do you know they're just waking up? So, Because we, we start pretty early here in Oz. I mean, I don't know about the UK, um, but when I go to the gym, it's packed at 6 a.m. It's packed at 5.30 a.m. sometimes, 5.30, 5, 5 a.m. This morning I was at the gym at uh, 10 past 4 and I, was, I saw a PT guy and he said he does a client at 4 a.m., who's a doctor, and I got quite a surprise that he has um, clients coming in for him. But this guy, particular clients, emergency doctor or something like that. But but do the UK, do they start at 7 a.m.? Is that what time people get out of bed? I can't get a coffee before 7 a.m. In, in the, the UK? UK? Anywhere. And Starbucks don't even open until maybe 7, which, and again, our coffee culture in the United Kingdom is terrible. Yeah, yeah. We've got Costa, Nero, Starbucks. Some of these companies are worth billions and not one of them can produce a good cup of coffee. Well, relative to, say, what you get here in Sydney, yeah. Yeah, obviously definitely a little bit of a coffee snob now, but yeah. it, so then... Is there's it because that, it's dark? Sorry. Is I think it is because, it's you know, dark. it's dark, people aren't waking up. I think that... They get a bed later? My, my culture in the UK was definitely go to work the latest possible. I thought I was a hero going to the gym at 7.30 because then I could skip rush hour traffic at 8.30 to get into work for 9.00. But I don't think people wake up quite as much. And I think that people are waking up between 6.30 and 7.30. And I'm actually going to capture them as they're scrolling their phone in bed in the morning or maybe commuting into work. These are my assumptions. I, I think that I... But could, is it working? At it? Yeah. And I think because I'm, I'm very impatient, hugely impatient. When I create something, I want to post it right then. I'm like, That's good. I'm, I feel like I'm itching. I think I might have some level of... I want to get tested uh, for ADHD. I have hyper focus on tasks such as editing, content creation, but my organizational skills are pretty terrible and even short term memory sometimes. Like, uh, you I almost have to be nannied in some respects, like James, you have a podcast tomorrow, don't forget. <laughs> and uh, so for me, people could say to me, Oh, you'd actually be better off posting it at 5 p.m. And I'm like, No, by 5 p.m., I want to know if the post is done. 5 p.m. Australia time. Yeah, yeah, I want to. Same time. You know, that's, that's late. I want to know who, if people are enjoying the post or not. I want to take criticisms from it. So, so you so you 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 post at a certain time, you post a certain type of content, you get their attention by being a little rough around the edges, which is not the, the UK thing. It's a bit more an Aussie sort of thing, you know. I mean, I get sometimes I get criticised for being a little bit uh, I swear a bit too much and stuff like that, but I don't give a fuck, to be honest. With you. Um, but that's a bit of an Aussie thing, so that might sort of get a bit of attention. And uh, and again, you say I don't know Formula One. I use this as an example all the time. I'm not sold on Formula One. If there were people in a friendship group talking about it, I would love to interject and go, guys, I think it's shit. Because then someone would go, who, who the fuck invited this guy? And seven people would go, he's a prick. But three of them would go, do you know what? 
I also think it's shit. And I think it's better that three people remember you're in the room mm. than no one at all. Yeah, so you don't want to be sanitized. It doesn't work. And and people that swear, I get on with better. Yeah. People that swear, I seem to, you know, someone drops a C-bomb in a convo, I'm like, I like him already, you know? And that's a particular taste of people, but it's okay. There are so many people on the planet where... If I, my clients, I, I, I used to joke around with them. My favorite clients face to face and I did thousands of hours. They swore, they'd call themselves fat. They wouldn't tiptoe around the subject. They'd like to drink. And I was like, I only want to work with these people. So I actually occasionally use the C-bomb and content to purge the following of people that are going to be terrible clients. Because it, there are so many people out there that all are trying to be politically correct. All that are remaining quiet on political subjects that are really touchy. And I was like, no, because there's this massive outcast group of people that are like me, that share similar values to me, they're going to make amazing clients. Well, I reckon there's more people like that than the other way. Uh, fucking goody two-shoes people um, out there. Um, you can't convert them anyway. I mean, they, they don't really want to get involved in whatever it is you do, and that's my view. So, I mean, I, at the end of the day, I don't give a fuck. I mean, if they don't want to like the way I speak, I guess you're taking the same view. Because I had a business, right, like many years ago, and people I, I used to say to me, what are you going to call the business? And uh, this is 25 years ago. And I said, I'm going to call the business Wizard Home Loans. And they said, you can't call your business Wizard Home Loans. Like in that, those days, you know, banks and everybody was all stitched up and conservative. And uh, I, I remember meeting Richard Branson and he told me that, because I, I talked about the name Virgin, and he said to me, the reason why Virgin works as a name is one, it's con controversial the name you never expect. Um, he said the other thing is it has some strong letters in it, virgin, like it's a strong sounding word. So it sort of resonates, it sits in your brain. So I thought wizard, it's a strong sounding word. Plus I, he said, and at the end of the day, if 50% of the people hate your name and 50% of the people like your name, that's better than trying to come up with a name that everyone thinks is okay because generally speaking they'll forget that name. He said, like, you're better off having people, and even the people who hate your name, if your products are all right, they'll still remember who you are. And so it's about people remembering, remembering who you are. So it's interesting um, that you take, you've taken it one step further. You're talking about content and the way the content gets delivered. Not, I don't mean the platform. I'm talking about the words you use, swearing, being a little bit confrontational. You've taken the name one step further. And by the way, Branson also has a name, virgin name, but he also is confrontational. He was, not so much these days, I guess, but he's very confrontational the way he goes about things. You know, he actually used to get, you um, know, I've seen uh, scenes of him turning up in places on an elephant and shit like that. Like, and uh, and that stuff, it's crowded. Instagram's crowded and you have to get attention and you have to cut through. You know, you remind me when I'm talking to you, you rem remind me of uh, Tony Jeffries. You know Tony Jeffries, English boxer? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if you're following him. Yeah, I do follow yeah. him. Uh, and what he's, what's interesting, what he's been doing recently is um, he's been um, putting up videos. Well, he's actually put up a video of him becoming a jiu-jitsu player as opposed to being a boxer and how shitty he is at it, but, which is quite clever. But what he has been doing is been getting, putting up, uh, which I, I just look at him all the time now, he puts up videos of guys doing stupid stuff in boxing and letting themselves get them themselves get punched in the head and just stupid stuff. And you go, what the fuck? Why would someone allow that, them, themselves to do that? And it works. It gets me, gets me engaged. Normally I would just flick through everything because, you know, I've seen so much of that shit, it doesn't matter. So I think what you're saying is, makes sense in a PT environment because the PT environment, I think, is pretty uh, tame, at least here in Australia. I don't know the UK one, but it's pretty tame here. It is, and the, the characters as well. Tony Jeffries is really good because he knows people's problems yeah. and he solves them in the video without having to ask. Yeah, yeah. And because I've coached so many people over the years, I know their problems. And so many personal trainers just fucking post their lunch and pictures themselves yeah. without their tops on. Yeah. And I had a... Oh, man, it kills me. I had a video go very viral. I got a million followers from a video. One video? One video on TikTok. And uh, it's called The Swimmer's Body Illusion. And a lot of people disagree with this, but in essence, let's say you wanted to get in shape, you wanted to aspire to a physique. So you see a bodybuilder and you go looks a bit broad he looks a bit stupid so i'm not going to do that and then you look at a runner you go oh, he looks a bit miserable looks a bit skinny i'm not going to do that so you look at a swimmer and you go great physique so you swim for a few months and then after a few months you go why the fuck don't i look like a swimmer and they say swimmers don't look the way they do because they swim they swim because of the way they look yeah 
it is their physique in most respects, having long arms, good reach, you know, maybe good back lat connection, buoyancy, bone density, all of these things. So that when you put 100 kids in a swimming pool in year four, whatever it is, 10 of them that stick to it and love it go, mum, dad, I want to go to a swim club. They go to a swim club, they end up swimming with county, go to the Olympics, whatever. So there are a percentage of people that don't have to work very hard to look good from a genetic standpoint, body fat, growing muscle mass. Even if it was a thousandth of a percentage, we'd have enough to follow two, 3,000 people each on Instagram. So these people exist out there. They train, they get muscle. They tighten up their diet a little bit. They get lean, they get abs, they get pecs. They get cut straight up. Their friends go, you should become a personal trainer. Not because they're empathetic, they're good at coaching, they understand problems, or their problem solvers, they look the part. So we now have a lot of people that don't look the way they do because of what they preach. They preach what they preach because the way they look. Yeah. So we've got now a very distorted world of coaches that got into the job for the wrong reason. The values are out of line, uh, you know, and they can't grasp people's problems. So they take pictures of their lunch and they do, you know, all of these crazy things. And I kind of injected myself into the industry with an understanding of people's problems. And every video, some people get really butt hurt and they get offended and other people get outrageous and want to counsel me. And I go, what the fuck do you think the motive of, is of that video? Yeah, it's for you to get butt hurt, but you're a bodybuilder who's getting annoyed that I've called you stupid. Or, you know, I say that when bodybuilders compete, they get to compete their insecurities against a load of other people in fake tan. I was like, well done. You get to impress other people with insecurities. But the reason I say that is to normalize the general public where they can go, oh, do you know what? I don't want to compete because I've had women for years go, James, I want to compete. I'm like, you don't. You want to keep your menstrual cycle. You want to lose a bit of weight and you want to have a better relationship with training. You don't want any sore joints and back and neck and... You don't want to have an eating disorder and the fact that most women when they compete not only lose their period, it hurts if they sit down for too long because their body fat percentage is so low. And when the people get really angry, I go, what do you reckon the motive is? Because Karen here, who's an IT manager in Sydney that works a very stressful job for 12 hours a day, she wants a better relationship with her body. And I'm saying this to make her feel better and to resonate with her. And it's crazy that, you know, a lot of the fitness people can't even recognize what I'm doing and they're still taking pictures of their lunch. I'm but, but that's good. But that, you want that. Mm. You don't want to recognize what you're doing. You don't want to turn the industry around. You want to be an out, outlier. Because if you're an outlier, then you're going to get a certain percentage of the marketplace and they're not going to swim in that in that, in that that pond. But at the same time as well, yeah. I kind of do want them to get it because there are still a lot of people with problems. And like I've had a lot of viral videos and success online, but even today I get asked questions. And the reason I get so annoyed, people go, they say I'm really angry on social media. I go, I'm not the first personal trainer someone's worked with, spoken to, or dealt with. So how the fuck do they still have this question? That means there is a a line of people that have let them down. And that really annoys me. I'm getting annoyed now just thinking about it. So like, I kind of wish the the fitness industry could understand that because if we can, it's not like we're in a saturated market where we're running out of overweight people to train. Health is on decline. Self-esteem is on a decline. Everything. I'm, I'm worried that if Elon Musk does get Neuralink going and the metaverse takes off, we're just going to be a bag of bones soon with a head come plugged into the internet. What would you describe your mission as then? Like, apart from, you know, making noise, like, you know, and being and standing out. It sounds very cliche to say, to leave the fitness industry in a better place than I found it. Because I wasn't always a fitness person. I was a very confused teenager. Even as a kid at school, I'd go up to the dinner ladies and point at food and say, is this fattening? Is this fattening? Is this fattening? I, could, I couldn't get a decisive why? answer. Why? Because I was overweight as a kid oh, and, I, really? and I, I didn't have a clue why. And even at 18, 19, I wish I kind of knew what I did now when I was younger and aspiring to play rugby at a high level, which by the way, would have been the worst thing that ever happened to me. Where being a successful rugby player is amazing and it's probably, you know, like ecstasy until your mid thirties and your career falls off a cliff. And I look at my friends who played high level and I think, thank God I wasn't that good. So, uh, you know, the mission really would be that Anyone around the world could ask their friend how to lose fat and their friend would know. And parents as well, like this is controversial as well. Parents keep thinking schools need to do more for childhood obesity. I'm like, you've got a teacher looking after 30 kids and that teacher's not paid enough for what they're doing anyway. How can you expect someone else to care that much about your kids when ultimately when I was a kid, there was only one person I'd listen to and that's my parents. Or two people I'd listen to and that's my parents. So if we were to get the majority of Australia and bring them in at random. How, how'd you lose fat? 
I'm not sure enough people would be able to give a definitive answer. What is it? Calorie deficit. Yeah. Which is my kind of slogan where people fail to realize that on one end of the spectrum, we have the consumer. And on the other spectrum, we have the principle, which is that to elicit fat loss, we need people to consume fewer calories than what they are, than what they're consuming through drink and, and food. And it's very similar to finance. If you are accruing more cash than you're spending, you'll be left with money in the bank. And you need to flip that on its head. And it's not easy. There are adaptions, there are loads of other complications, but unfortunately the industries that we know create methods that separate the consumer from the principal. They keep everyone at arm's length. They create, you know, sins at Slimming World. They create systems. They create all of these ways to, rem keeping people confused is very profitable. And that to me is kind of something where I'd like to tear them all down and change it around. So we have consumer principle then methods because once you understand the principle you can select methods you want oh you don't get hungry in the morning cool have some coffees and don't eat breakfast you know i'd much rather just have one big meal a day cool one meal a day um i get very sluggish when i have carbs cool go low carb or whatever it is but the system is fundamentally wrong at the moment and i'd like it to change so most people don't know what a calorie is how many calories they consume just resting in other words what their heart lungs intestines, digestion system, brain consumes without doing any exercise. They just assume they burn calories through exercise, but they don't realize they're burning most of the calories just sitting around, even sleeping at night, you burn a lot of calories. Um, so when you talk about calorie deficit, how do you teach people um, what does that really mean in terms of not just what I put in my, my gob, but what I actually put out as well Australia is an interesting one because you use kilojoules interchangeably with calories. Mm. I don't know why, why anyone would do that, but it's, it's like when you go to America and they use Fahrenheit. You're like, you just wanted to fuck the system somehow. Yeah. You wanted well, to make four things. times, four times a calorie. Yeah. Kilojoules is about four times a calorie. Sometimes it's like, how much? Then you're like deciphering it, like hieroglyphics. So, um, well, that's part of the problem too, by the way, because people don't know. And a hundred percent, you're completely correct. Uh, where I like to educate people on this as well, where I show them, these are the components of where energy goes in a day. 10% is training you know, 60% is at rest. And that is a burden off people's shoulders because if I have a highly stressed individual that's working long hours, someone, they might think I need to train more. I go, no, you actually need to do less. You know, how about we get you walk into work so you can do your emails frantically over a two kilometer walk or, you know, try and find something that fits that person. Hey, you only get half an hour at lunch. So I want you to go to this sandwich shop that's one kilometer away and I want you to have this sandwich here. You know, put these strategies in place to fit people's lives. Do you do it per person though? Like, uh, no, give them the tools to understand it so they can do it. This is These are things that I've done on a one-to-one -one basis. So if I go online onto James Smith Academy. We have coaches as well. Coaches so as well. So I can put a call for coach. Yeah, so coaches there at all times. So I've, I've got about 10 coaches that help rotate programs for people and to support them with the programming because people need help still. Yeah. But rather than paying someone, you know, $120 for an hour, our uh, monthly membership is about $86. So they can pay that for the month. And it does take sometimes 24 hours for someone to come back to them. And sometimes it will be a different coach, but these are ways that we keep their costs and down. And they answer the question like online. Yeah, or online. Or so text. Or through the app. message. Yeah, so yeah. They, someone says, hey, what does RPE mean? Oh, sorry, this means rate of perceived exertion. It's in this module you can access here. But with the, the components of energy expenditure, one of the big ones that people overlook is something called NEAT, which is the amount of calories you burn in non-planned training. So... Neat, we burn more calories moving a day than we do training a day. So giving people habits of the step count, walking up escalators. I get annoyed at people, able-bodied people that stand still on escalators. You've been given the opportunity to move faster and you decided to stand still. I think from an attitude perspective, that stinks as well, where, you know, you give someone an opportunity in life, you want them to use that to move faster, not as an opportunity to do nothing. So you might have seen that with like investments before where you, I, I'm not, well-versed in the investment world. You give someone capital to do something and they just sit on their ass and don't do anything. And you're like, it's the polar opposite of the reason. Call negative carry. We call it negative carry. So you go backwards. Yeah. And and it annoys me that so many people, they look at it as, they we're both looking at an escalator, but I'm seeing it as a way to move at a superhuman speed without running. You're looking at it as a way to stand still and, and do nothing. So I say to people, you know, this neat component is really important. And when we put people in calorie deficits for prolonged periods, they will burn fewer calories over time. This is a part of the body adapting to it. And the biggest way you can offset that is to keep your NEAT high. 
And that's why people that manage their step counts have more success long-term dieting because they can get real life readings on reductions in movement, whereas other people don't realize. And if I was competing for a physique show and you would do an interview with me, my hands would move less. I'd have less facial expressions. The body has so many adaptions. Females, especially when you diet them aggressively, sit down at given opportunities, less likely to take the stairs, fidget less. The adaptions that they have are much more severe than men because women need a higher amount of body fat to survive pregnancy. So we see that dieting females is often harder than men. It's interesting. So I, I, I once interviewed a guy, um, he's called a fight dietitian, he's a dietitian for fighters, um, and uh, he's, he's um, n- named... Um, I've had him, George, I've had him on a couple of times. Yeah, George. He's a very interesting guy. Yeah. And he talks about, uh, and he's talking about professional fighters, and uh, but the sort of what you're talking about is sort of interesting because... And you know, I've been through his program a few times when I've had a few fights and uh, where I've had to make weight. You know, these are sort of pretty severe sort of environments. I'm not suggesting this is for people who want to lose weight. But um, what's interesting is he, he likes to get a benchmark you. So he gives you a baseline. So he sends you off to get a, a DEXA reading. So just so your body fat's distributed. Um, to, and also, but what's important about that is to make sure you're not trying to lose too much weight as a percentage. Uh, in other words, if you've got 20% body fat, on the DEXA scan, then, you know, you've got some room to move. But if you if your body fat's already 11%, well, that, that could be a bit dangerous if you're trying to lose weight, um, particularly in the fight game. Um, but then he does, then he'll get you on a uh, metabolic rate test, which sort of tests the amount of calories you use at rest, which is something that's, I didn't know what it would be until I did this for the first time. And I was like 900 calories or something is what I burn without doing anything, just sitting there. That's all your lungs are moving. And then what you just said something interesting. He then just makes some assumptions, but it's based on machine learning. Um, assumptions as to if you do a one hour training session at, uh, you know, like a high intensity thing, you might burn 350 calories. So you'll say, okay, well, you're 1,900 calories at rest, 350 calories on top of that. Then you're walking and you're working, you make some other assumptions. He says, okay, you burn, I oh, know, I'm making this shit up, 3,500 calories a day, which means you can eat three and a half thousand calories. So Mark, here's a diet with three and a half thousand calories in it. You know, like it's not a diet, but here's a a meal plan, let's call it. And he goes down right to the very point where you can actually, he tells you who to go and buy it from. So he'll ring up to one of the meal organizations. There's heaps of them in Australia now. He'll ring TikTok up, the TikTok guys up and, uh, and he'll say, I want these meals made, you know, four or five meals a day. And it's quite easy to lose weight, but really what it is about having um, baselines and, and understanding the baseline. So is that where you're trying to t- 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 take it out of a professional environment and put it to a normal person? Is that where you're sort of trying to explain to everybody? Yeah, and a lot of my social media strategy now is surrounding saying to people as a call to action on TikTok even, it says, find out your deficit, use my online calculator. But it's much cruder than that. It goes, you're this age, this gender, this height, this weight. How often do you train? We ask them. Lightly active, very active, moderately active. And I even say to people to always over egg it. And they ask me why. And I say, look, one of the best things that can happen is you do the calories that my calculator gives you and nothing happens because then we know to go lower. By 10%, let's do that. But if you are too excited or zealous in the onset of starting a deficit, you'll feel tired, fatigued, grouchy, mm. undermotivated. No, I've been there. It's and the worst. So I say to people, this is, and I say to them openly, I go, I've got no fucking idea if this will work. But guess what? You will if you do it for two to three weeks. And then I reduce it and people go, what if it stops working? I say, well, then we can reduce it further and see how you feel. If we reduce it further and you feel like shit, then maybe we've gone too far. But it's about saying to people, they're to be their own best scientists with this. I give you the tools, you need to make them work. And like you say, saying to people with a bit of confidence, this is how many calories I think you burn with your lifestyle. I could be grossly wrong. Let's give it a go. Let's let's try it out for a while. But one of the best motivators in this space that people don't realize is results or similar in any space where I don't, I don't say to them, you need to eat five feedings of veg a day. I don't say you need a fiber target in the onset. I have this analogy with fat loss where I say, if you've got a leak in your bathroom, the first thing we need to do is stop the leak. And that is getting a calorie deficit or at least stop actively gaining weight. Training modalities are like what mop or piece of, you know, implement at home you're going to use to wipe the floor. 
So many people arrive at dieting and start cleaning the mess up without addressing the leak. Mm. So if people just turn a blind eye to their calorie intake and start doing training, they're doing F45, doing all of these things, they're just wiping down a floor without addressing the leak. And to put that peace of mind in someone to go, look, on 2,800 calories, I believe your leak is stops. I don't give a fuck what you do. Walk. You know, I, I saw something the other day. I need to see if this peer-reviewed chess champions burn thousands of calories in computing their opponent's moves with the brain. The brain does a lot as well. Yeah. And I'm sure you can feel a bit of a sugar crash after um, very deep, hard work situations. You finish and the task is like, I'm fucking starving. Mm. So yeah, the brain uses a lot of uh, energy as well. And I think it can be quite, like what you're saying with the, the, the calories that I set someone, I set a 15% deficit. It's not too aggressive. It's quite nice actually. And we burn roughly 10% of our calories a day through training. And the reason I say to people to not trust my fitness power is my fitness power gives you the calories if you train, it takes them away if you don't, or it never gives them to you in the first place. I say to my clients, if you don't train today, it doesn't mean you can't have the food. Your deficit just went from 15% to 5%. And that should be your motivator. That if you're skipping the gym a lot, your progress is going to be slower. Not that you don't deserve to have dinner like a hamster on a wheel. And when they hear it that way, they go, fuck, this is actually something that I quite like the sound of. And I think that some people just really struggle to get that point across. It's really interesting. I was talking to a guy this morning who I know really well. And he's one of these mad guys who runs, he used to run, 20 kilometers a day, like, or more. And I'd, say, I'd be seeing him in places like, what the fuck are you doing here, Joe? Like, I'll be having breakfast or something. And I'd see Joe running past. I always seem to see him once a week somewhere. And he, in the, but he always had weight around his guts, you know, like it. He was heavy around here and it got to this point where his legs started blowing up, his knees started going on him because he just ran so much, so much, so far, so long on a hard surface he just, and, and he was older, getting older and he blew himself out. And anyway, he said to me that he thinks that now he's changed. He doesn't run anymore. He goes to the gym but he's changed his diet completely, okay? And he's, he's one of these guys who pays 100 bucks an hour for a personal trainer and she's really good. She's giving him a diet, et cetera. And he's actually gained weight but lost all the fat. He's gained muscle but lost all the, all the fat. And uh, he said to me, when he was running, he said, he said, I think that I was running so that I could eat. So I'd run 20Ks a day that, and I would justify it. Well, I ran 20Ks today or I'm going to run 20Ks tonight. I can do all the shit in the world today. And he said, I was, I was training so I could eat as opposed to eating so that I could lead a healthy, healthy lifestyle. And now he's, he's completely flipped that on its head. He doesn't do any running at all. He's now mostly weight work and strength work and stuff like that. And uh, But it's all about his diet. But he hasn't lost weight. He's actually gained weight, but he's lost that unwanted fat that he had around his guts, which was unhealthy as he gets gets older. As you get older, you know, that's sort of pretty bad, that sort of fat that sort of exists with inside your body, not not on the outside, whatever they call it, visceral, visceral fat. fat yeah. yeah, that stuff also on the inside. And uh, he's he got a DEXA scan. He's, he's lost all that. It's all gone. It's taken a year, but... You become very efficient with running as well, which is kind of a bit of a danger. Cardio absolutely has its place for heart health. I do kind of, I, I like poking the bear a bit with this online socials, social media. People go, you need cardio for heart health. I go, yeah, I get that. But it's also the heart that pumps blood to your muscles doing heavy squats and bench press and deadlifts mm -hmm. and whatever. But yeah, running, you become very efficient and it is often the joints that can take the bugbear of it. And again, swimmer's body illusion where you give a thousand people weight training, you get a hundred who get no response. They end up going out running. They love it because the gym never offered them that kind of benefit of muscle growth or feeling good from it. But I love to say to people like, never go to the gym to burn calories. Go to the gym to get stronger. If you want to manipulate your calories, it's a lot easier to not eat something that is anything else. But I don't like this idea of people trying to earn their dinner or earn food back going yeah. there because then they select the wrong modalities. And again, when looking to motivate people we have intrinsic where people find something you know rewarding and fulfilling and extrinsic where you motivate someone to avoid something bad happening and to say to someone go run 20k or you have a heart attack and die it's the wrong motivator in the same sense that if people are working a job just for the money they're in essence working a job so they don't go bankrupt and they are working a job to stop something bad happening when you have a business owner who has his own business often they're doing something that's incredibly fulfilling 
So as soon as I hear or feel or sense that someone's exercising to burn calories, I sense extrinsic motivation. I feel like it's being forced and therefore it won't be sustainable. Do you do explain this stuff on online? Do you explain this stuff on your socials? Yeah, yeah I'm, I don't shut the fuck up. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. always talking about this. And again... Do you get as technical as Jordan Jordan Sullivan? Like his stuff is pretty pretty pro, pretty technical. Uh, no, I stay out of his realm. I don't yeah. want to stand on his toes. Yeah. We the same sense that I'm sure if someone needed something dumbing down, he'd probably say, oh, I'd watch James Smith's videos. Yeah, if yeah, someone yeah. asked me about making weight, because I compete in jiu-jitsu as well, yeah. I'd say, mate, ask him. You know, he's the guy I, I very much would like to stay in my own lane with that. Yeah. But I'm always explaining these things. I'm always doing like, and again, so the first book I did was called Not a Diet Book, which was ironic because I everyone Not has, a Diet. Not a Diet Book. So I was like, everyone's releasing a fucking diet book. I was like, that's the last thing I want. So I was like, hey, this isn't a diet book. Here's some of the reasons that I think you're struggling with uh, your weight. And then my second book was called Not a Life Coach. I was taking the piss. I was like, I'm not a fucking life coach. But I was saying to people, if you don't enjoy your work life and you're in a bad relationship, you're fucked to cutting calories and training. Who the, if, if you don't enjoy your work or your relationship, the only way you can get pleasure is through food. So mm. I'm not surprised that some people are overweight. And the thing we just spoke about, about having something fulfilling, with work life, I say to people, you're much better off earning 40K doing something you like than 60K doing something you hate. And then with relationships as well, again, I'm sure you've experienced this in the investorship world, sunk cost fallacy where people remain invested in something purely off the resources, time and energy they've put into it, not whether or not it's a sound investment. And I know that I've read in a few books that the older investors say, look, we need to walk away from this investment. Mm -hmm. Maybe some people that put money into crypto recently or whatever, they're like, let's get the fuck out. Whereas youngsters like, no, it's a bear market. We'll get it back. I'll so, keep buying. Yeah, yeah. Keep Average buying. down. It's called averaging down. So you've got these people in relationships and you go, you know, they let's say you've got a couple that you're friends with and you go, why the fuck are you still with this wanker? Oh, we've been together six years. They're using their previous investment as a reason to stay invested. So again, the second book was about cleaning up someone's life so that they could then get into a place of dieting and training. When you're out of a relationship that doesn't serve you and you work in a job that puts a smile on your face, the idea of bettering yourself isn't such an uphill task. And this third book... So how this to, is the book now. How, how to be uh, confident. How to be confident. This is more so about getting people to make choices that point towards action rather than inaction. I like to tell people that confident people don't have a good relationship with success. They have a good relationship with failure. Now, the reason that I've done well on social media is I posted for four years without making any money. I've had so many videos and posts that bombed. I put my heart and soul into posts that lost me followers. I remember when I had like 500 followers, I wrote what the best blog was on my lunch break. I didn't even eat. I trained people all afternoon because I was hungry. And then I looked the next day, I've lost five followers. It's like, oh. But over the years, I've become so conditioned to being okay with failing on the gym floor, prospecting. Nine out of 10 people told me to fuck off. I worked in door-to-door -door sales in the UK in an area called Gloucester selling gas and electric. Even more people told me to fuck off. I only realized that any sense of confidence that people might sense from me was within my ability to fail happily. So I've written a book now to change people's values surrounding confidence. It's not a superpower because superpowers aren't available to everyone. Confidence is. And it's a set of values. It's a set of beliefs that you have surrounding a topic. And for example, like, give me an example. Can you sort of... The three main ones that I like to look at is with relationships, especially when people are petrified to ask someone out or to give someone their number. The chivalrous kind of bout of even just saying to someone, you know, hey, would it be okay if I give you my number? You can, or can I have your number? Feel free to give me a fake one. That's gone. You know, especially since the pandemic. Within jobs, again, loss aversion, where people, their mind is always leaning to a negative outcome in anything. And I think from an evolutionary standpoint, it definitely has a place. But when maybe talking to your boss about your role, not being happy in your role, not being valued within your organization or what you're doing, people are lacking what they think is the confidence to ask for these things. But really, the worst case scenarios are never really the worst case scenarios. They think they're going to get fired or shunted or rejected. And even if they do get rejected, it adds a string to the bow of their competence. But again, within every area of life that people struggle with, they seem to think they don't have something or that they don't have the capabilities. Well, there's a loss. They yeah. They'll lose something. And if if I do go up to a girl, I'd be in a lot of trouble with my current girlfriend if I did, but if I went and asked for someone's number and I was polite and I was courteous about it, if I was to get rejected, I just became better at that. If I was to 
cold call a business or even turn up face to face to business to pitch my idea. You know, I might get rejected, but I've just become that little bit more competent. And again, with people's passion projects, I, I do often worry in my mind, I go, becoming a personal trainer for me was about not following the status quo, it was about following my values. And I was more than happy to fail because I was miserable working in recruitment. And I said, if this doesn't work out as a PT, I'll give it a go for six months. And worst case, I'll go back to recruitment. And it kills me that some people aren't confident enough to go after something they might enjoy. And the thing that I, I really nail people with is so many people are excelling at a job they hate. <laughs> and they don't think they could ever succeed doing something they like or they're passionate about. And that blows my mind. But do you think that's because they fear failure? Yeah. It just So it's funny, you know, because um, you, you, given that you're interested in, in um, jiu-jitsu and MMA, um, you might know John Kavanagh, the uh, Conor McGregor's coach, and he wrote a book called Win or Learn. Um, and uh, he never says win or lose, it's win or learn. And there's no such, in his view, every time you lose or fail, or get rejected on the example you gave before about asking someone for their phone number, um, you actually learn something. If you look at it this way, uh, hang on, what, what did I do wrong? Or, or how did I go about that? Was my body language or was it my, the words I used or was my gestures in my hand or was, uh, you know, you know, I don't know, what, or is there someone who looks like that just never going to want to give me that number, you know, relatively speaking, which means I should avoid those sorts of people? Or was it a too windy or too cold or was it too early? or too? I mean, you can come out with a thousand and you can learn from those experiences. And I think it's, that's a mindset thing. Um, being confident, I mean, I'll, I'll read your book, but being confident is, I think, is about being prepared to, as you say, fail or lose, but not looking at it like that being prepared to perhaps another way of doing it is learn. Learn about yourself. I had um, a, a, lad, well, a chap called Hicks and Gracie. He's one of the most decorated martial artists full time. He's got a red and white belt. Yeah. And uh, he was one of the original Gracie family. Yeah. Hard nuts. I don't think he ever lost a fight in Valley Chudo, which became MMA. And he used to have people come to the gym to fight him out. He did a lot of fights in Japan. And on the podcast, he said to me something that was very profound that I put in the book. And he says, losing is not the same as being defeated. He goes, you can lose a fight, but you're only ever defeated if you then never fight again. So let's say you train jiu-jitsu for six months, you go to competition, you get your ass kicked and you never do jiu-jitsu again, you're defeated. Mm. You, you can keep turning up and I've seen these guys do it at white belt. They go to comp, lose, go to comp, this was me at blue belt. Every comp I went to, I lost. But although I lost, I was never defeated because I would then go back to Bondi and go to the gym on a Sunday night. I've just competed during the day, lost all my matches, but I use that as a way to up the ante on my intensity to become better, to study more. Losing to me was an opportunity to get better. Whereas to some people, it's a reason to throw in the towel. And that definitely is a mindset. And again, something that I've probably included in all my books, something people have the inability to set their own definition of success. If you're someone listening to this and you, the idea of asking for someone's number petrifies you, why not set the success of metric as asking, not of getting the number? Mm. Then you could be successful 10 times and only get one number. Who the fuck is going to take that away from you? And I had a really bad uh, few competitions at Blue Belt. I, I would go with my whole team, I'd lose all my matches. And the it's probably the only time in the last five years I genuinely woke up feeling depressed was the day after because I attached such value to, to the sport and everything within it. And two weeks later, I'd entered another competition. I decided to go up a weight category and I got pissed the night before. And I won more matches that day than I've ever won before. And I got a bronze medal and I said to people, if I have the values of a jiu-jitsu athlete, this bronze medal would mean disappointment. But I don't have their values. I'm not keeping their values. And this bronze medal to me means the world because I've got myself out of a position I was at. And I was like, to me, it doesn't matter what this is. It's a sign of progress. And so many people go through life trying to use other people's values as a metrics for success. And they'll never be happy because of that. I often say to people, especially when people are sort of saying, in business, it's really tough because, you know, it's, I just don't seem to be increasing my numbers or revenues or can't cover my costs, whatever the case may be. Um, and I often say, it's easy for me to say, but I often say, well, you've got to bank every little win. But that again is about the mindset because you've got to actually be prepared to find the win. You've got to find the win, to find the thing that you just won. And some people aren't real good at that because they haven't really uh, built that as part of the habits. What you're saying, that example of the Blue Belt competition, you, what you're saying is that you learned how to bank your wins but to bank your wins, you've got to find the win. You've got to see that's a win. Or the example of I asked the girl as opposed to her saying yes, the win was I asked her for a phone number. I say this to white belts as well. I go, you turn up to a competition. And I say to people, 
I fucking hate competing. It's nerve wracking. You're in a sweaty sports hall in Sutherland and you can about to have someone potentially injure you. Like this is not enjoyable, mm. but you get there, you weigh in, you step out on the mat. As you take your flip flops off or chandles or whatever, thongs you put on, when you step on the mat, you've won. Now you've got to compete and make sure you don't get defeated. And if you win, it's a bonus. But another thing that I love that, again, you might disagree. So that's in the book. This is this is, this is all yeah. part of that. Yeah, okay, cool. And this is like, rather than just being like, hey, mate, be more confident. I want to break it down so people really understand Give it. Give them real tools. Yeah. And it, it's when you have a business and when you start business, once you get to the point where your business can afford to fly you with your legs out straight, which is a very great part of running a business, most things in life are the same. People really struggle to appreciate this. Whether your business is making a million dollars a year or $50 million a year, you have the same MacBook, you have the same iPhone, you get in the same traffic in Sydney. <laughs> you have all of these kind of same like, problems. You, you, in you your can life. eat the same oranges. And even, yeah, and even for me on social media, the platform's the same, the interaction's the same. I still record on the same camera, same memory card, same edit, same everything. The numbers just change and the numbers can feel very arbitrary after a while. And when I hit a million followers on Instagram, which is, my lifetime goal a few years ago would have been 100,000. When I hit 10K, we begged a cake. I was like, I fucking made it. I felt very numb. I felt very empty inside. I felt like I'd been working towards something that, that didn't actually mean anything. And I had to snap myself out of it. And I was like, are you fucking crazy? I'd become so numb to the levels of success. I had to program myself very hard to go, this is a big deal. You And people in business need to do this all the time. If, the, if you don't identify the win, the win it will just go away. And, and another thing that's hard is all these wins feel the same and people can't quantify that. You don't get an Uber surcharge on dopamine and serotonin. You know, getting a client that pays you here or getting a client that pays you here or even your business having its most successful quarter and you may be floating on the stock market. You don't wake up the next day like, oh my God, this is the most pleasure I've ever felt. It's not like taking drugs. The, the feelings and emotions are the same. So when someone's business makes its first million, it's going to feel the same as 10 million it's going to feel as 50 million but they don't believe you they never believe you that it's all the same and they always seem to think that there's a linear trajectory to happiness with business and success but it actually becomes harder you actually have to be like this is good you, you have to talk to yourself so much about to enjoy the processes and i kind of sometimes think back and i i look back to how grateful i was for the little wins back then and i kind of have to think to myself like on a scale it's it's hard work now to go, mate. This is good. It's hard to pat yourself on the back. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean, it's a bit cliche, but it's it's about the journey, but it's also about the process that you put it through. They're they're the wins, being able to un identify the process, and being able to yield to the process, and being able to back up and continue to do the process, and just stick with it to some extent. It's not just. I remember when I sold my wizard business, and um, I was in New York um, when the transaction completed, and. Uh, we sold the business for five hundred million dollars. I saw that in two thousand and four, and uh, and I the seven month period it took to do this, to, like complete the sale. Like we started the process, took seven months. Um, I always kept thinking, oh, it's gonna be so good, so good if I ever get this done. But the night I got it, I collected what I had to collect. Um, I had to go up to a certain place in New York, at ten o'clock, nine o'clock at night to get the get the check, and. Uh, I came back to my room and I, I booked myself in the Four Seasons Hotel, which is a pretty ritzy place in, in New York, place I would not normally stay. And uh, I came back to my room, was on my own, and ordered pizza and had a beer out of the fridge. And uh, it wa and really I thought about it, it, it wasn't the big moment that I thought it would be. It wasn't really what was important for me was actually the process of getting there. And and the thing, and someone asked me when they, they did this thing called Australian Story in Australia and they asked me, you know, what was the most important thing for you? And I thought, I actually said, uh, actually it's the people I met and the people I watched grow, become really good at what they do. Um, you know, the watch people who work for me, who worked with me, they have get married, have kids. That's, and, and, the, and, and the people we helped at the end of the day, that was the most important thing. And for me, just getting up and keep going, keeping very, at it. The very first page of the book in the very, the foreword, it says, the man who loves to walk will walk further than the man that loves the destination. And that encapsulates it completely. Well, it took me a long time to work it. I always thought it was about the destination. I always was thinking about the check and uh, it meant fucking nothing to me. Um, I mean, it was important clearly, but 
it wasn't that important. It was all the stuff that led up to it. The thing that actually, the real value I got out of everything I did was what I did and the fact that I could get up every day and keep working and keep at it and not give up. And so, that, so your book on confidence, um, I'd imagine a lot, a lot of your followers, of which you are many, um, do you think that your followers are more in need today of this advice, co- how to get confidence or how to be confident or the tools to operate confidently are more in need of it than they were, say, 10 years ago. Do you think that there's more pressure on people's confidence today relative to what it, what it was? Yeah, I mean, we have a heavily reliance on technology, heavy reliance on dating apps, heavy reliance on LinkedIn, for instance, for, you know, applying for jobs. The, the list goes on. But one thing that I wanted people to really understand is, you know, there's 16 personalities that you get bundled into if you do online tests. Not one of them is confident. These are, we're all individually unique, but it's not a superpower we don't possess. Quite frankly, in life, so many opportunities present themselves and there's a delta in the road to either action or inaction. And people are picking inaction under this self-labeled idealism that they're not confident. And people need to assess these opportunities and instead pick the path of action. It won't be comfortable. It won't be pleasant. It won't be, you know, congruent to an easy life, but it's fucking worth it. And people really need to appreciate that. And that's really the kind of take home message of the book. And when you look at people that have experienced success, they're not built differently. There's a quote that the world is built by people no smarter than you. What's your online coaching business called? Is it James Smith Academy? Yeah, James Smith Academy. Dot com? Dot com, yeah. Dot dot, dot com, just dot com, not dot com. James Smith Academy dot com. Yeah, yeah, not dot au, you're in. Dot uk, whatever. So we have that that for the coaching and the books and uh, I do live talks. I've got a live tour coming up where some of the things that I've spoken about. Like an audience? Yeah, yeah we've yeah. got uh, three and a half thousand people in London. Which yeah, is cool. Sydney Opera House in November, which is going to be pretty mental. Uh, in essence, I try and cultivate the best part of a TED talk with a bit of stand-up. So a bit of comedy, a, you mean? Yeah, I've yeah. got a, so there's a, there's a few things that I know tickle the audience sometimes. So I try and take a really salient, important point and then bring a personal anecdote and a story uh, on my on my last talk, I'd have, you know, funny bits that would be very relevant to my personal life and conversations I had with my dad and all of these things. And for instance, I'd bring up a joke that my dad has been married to my mum for so long that he could have committed murder twice and done the time he'd been <laughs> out. And people always ask me what my uh, death row meal would be. I go, my dad did two life sentences. He doesn't get to pick what's for fucking dinner. So there's no <laughs> chance. We should let prisoners have the chance. So, you know, but then I'll go into another important topic. So, yeah, we've got that coming up as well. And and one of the young fellows here um, who's one in the production team here um, said that when he first went to the gym, he actually used your website to sort of, um, I don't know, make him feel comfortable about what he was about to do. Is, is that, I guess that's part of the confidence thing, but is that, is that the sort of thing that, um, He's a, he's a younger guy, so um, and probably wasn't really a gym dude. Um, so, so we um in the academy, we actually give everyone a coach assigned program for a week for free. So we're confident in our coaching that if we give enough people the free program, enough of them will join to make it cost efficient, which is a very bold means because it costs us money. And sometimes when I do big pushes on pr- platforms like TikTok, we end up losing a lot of money because we're getting leads that aren't very warm and people just want a free program to piss off with. So yeah, we 90% of the app is free. It's just the paid coaching you've got to pay for. And me and my business partner are now bringing out another app that's going to be completely free. Uh, so that people can access stuff from not only myself, but other coaches, because it's hundreds of thousands of dollars to build an app that's anywhere near competent. So we're going to be looking to make coaching and information as accessible as possible. And I am I have full faith that we will maintain a paid program that will keep the lights on both ends. I drive a five-year-old golf. I got my skateboard and I live in Bondi. As long as those costs are covered and I can still stretch my legs out when I go home to see my parents, I'll be fine. Well, James Smith, um, I, I think actually I like the way you go about things because I'm a little bit like that myself. A l- little, um, not controversial, gruff is probably a good way of putting it and uh, gruff but at the same time respectful. I like what you're doing. Good luck with the book. Good luck with the talk in November. Um, show, throw us a ticket. I might come along. Perfect. And um, I might ask a, a, a question or two if you get the Q&As. And, um, and it's good to see it's good to see somebody going against the grain of what I consider to be 
not the establishment, but the established way of doing things. You know, you are competing by questioning what everybody else is saying is the standard, but you're going against the momentum. It's not quite disruption because I think disruption has been, you know, such a fucking overused word now anyway. But uh, what you're doing is you're actually challenging uh, people's views on, you know, losing weight, how to train, how to approach things. I think that's cool. That's good and it's good to see a Brit in Bondi doing something other than partying on uh, Christmas Day and New Year's Eve. (laughs) Good man. Cheers. Thank you very much. Thanks, James. Thanks.